So if we'll, we'll get started, I suppose. So I'll just quickly, I say I'll do it quickly, but who knows if it's going to work or not for me. Um, I'm just going to share my screen and give you a little run through. So this evening, we're going to hear from Mary, from Jessica and from Callum. And we're going to have a short video by Mary Toomey as well. Um, Mary Toomey is the project ecologist working with the REEC CIP project. Uh, Mary Sheehan, as many of you know, is a conservation ranger working with the MPWS in Clarny National Park. Jessica Hamilton is a an botanist and an ecologist, and she is currently working on a research pro project in Clarny National Park, looking at the native woodlands there. And Callum has just joined a local project in the Evera Peninsula, which is just adjacent to the Kerry Biosphere Reserve. Um, and he's a plant scientist. So he's going to speak a little bit about that project and what he hopes to be researching while during his time with them. So I'm just going to invite, oh, sorry, we'll have a Q&A session at the end. So do put your questions into the Q&A box and we'll hopefully all be finished up by 9 p.m. Um, fingers crossed. So I'll hand over to Dean to do a little introduction because this is a, a joint effort between Kerry, Dublin Bay and the Isle of Man. So tell us a little bit about Dublin Bay, Dean. Yeah, sure. Um, I just want to say, I mean, obviously, um, this tribe biosphere series involves the three local biospheres, so ourselves and the Isle of Man, and it's a great opportunity to share ideas and the like. And uh, certainly, we we've learned a lot um, from the Isle of Man and from Kerry through these various webinars. Um, and the great thing about these webinars is they are recorded and they are shared on YouTube for people to view down the line. So there's a lot of extra benefit to be, you know, to be had from these. Um, I just want to say uh, there's a few projects that we're running that we're running in collaboration. Um, one is a young nature bloggers competition um, that uh, the deadline has been extended and that gives young people a chance to write a little bit about um, their interest in nature, share their passion for nature. And there's some really great prizes amongst the local biospheres. Um, and we're also running uh, locally a biosphere award, which it was an idea that came originally from something that's been done on the Isle of Man and I believe Eleanor that maybe Kerry will be doing something similar and this is for young people to um, to do three things really experience nature um, immerse themselves in nature use all their senses to uh, you know explore and find out what's happening to learn about the processes that are going on so certainly um, you know with the likes of uh, Jessica Mary and Callum here you know they've done that they've done all the learning and we can we can uh, learn from them through sessions like this um, and then it's uh, the, the final part of the uh, biosphere award is to take action, to do something to help protect that biosphere once you've got that level of knowledge. Um, and like I say, that's a, that's a project that came out of um, working with other biospheres. So I wanted to share that. I mean, you know, the, the biosphere program is all about collaboration, learning um, and, 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 you know, from that learning, putting some action into place. So I'm going to pass back to Eleanor. I've muted myself there, so I'm taking a big pause before I, I get back to everyone. Um, so I'm just going to quickly share the screen again. And I want to give you just a brief introduction to the Kerry Biosphere Reserve. So we're going to be diving into a few of the different habitats that we have here and specifically focusing on the plant species that you find in those habitats tonight with some of our local experts. Um, and now I'm definitely not a plant expert, so I'm going to give you a broad overview about the Biosphere Reserve so you know the general area that we're talking about. So to start off with, what is a Biosphere Reserve? Well, they are areas that are internationally recognised for their biodiversity, yet also actively manage to promote a balanced relationship between people and nature. They're designated by UNESCO, which is the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organisation. And this man in the Biosphere Programme was first launched back in 1971. Now the Kerry Biosphere was first designated in 1982 and then expanded in 2017. And I'll show you a map later that talks a little bit more about that and shows you the different areas. So globally, there is a network of 714 biospheres across 129 countries. So I'm delighted to be part of the team of three that are working on this biosphere webinar this year, celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Man in the Biosphere program. Biosphere reserves work across three different pillars or three different areas of focus. So they're always an element of nature conservation. We're looking at development around environmentally sustainable economy and societies. And then we're also promoting learning, supporting environmental education, training, research and monitoring projects. So here's the map I promised. So the red area in the centre coincides with Clarny National Park. So that was the original biosphere reserve that was designated. 
In 2017, it was expanded because we required a buffer zone and a transition area to meet the criteria for biosphere reserves set by UNESCO. So the RNG area is what we call the buffer zone, and then the green area is the transition zone. So Mary's video later will talk a little bit about the upland heath areas, and they're over by Carantula here, which is Ireland's highest mountain, most of you will know already. Mary's going to talk about some of the uh, lake margins and the grasslands that can be found within the National Park and areas outside as well. We've got a, a whole series of lakes throughout the McGillicuddy Reeks and over here into the, the eastern side of the park as well. Um, and then Jessica is going to focus on the woodlands that can be found within the National Park. So just to talk about a few projects that we have running in the Kerry Biosphere as well, taking my moment to plug them. Um, we're looking for a logo design at the moment. So we have an open competition. So if you're an artist, a designer, or you know someone who is, let them know, get them to send in their, their submission, and then we'll be voting on it later in the year. The competition's open till September 30th, and all the details are on the website, carrybiosphere.ie. Now, I spent most of today actually working on this. <laughs> we have an art exhibition currently running in the Marquis at Killarney House for Heritage Week. And what's on, on display are the uh, entries from primary school students from all over Kerry that have made up the My Kerry Biosphere calendar for last year, 20, well, from last year's competition for this year's calendar 2021, and the ones that have just been selected for a calendar that's being printed at the moment for 2022. So you can go and see copies of those um, artworks from the students from first to sixth class anytime during the week that Clarny House is open. The marquee's out the back. If you ask in Clarny House, they'll give you directions out to it. Now, if you want to get in touch, we do have a website, kerrybiosphere.ie. You can email me. I work with South Kerry Development Partnership. So the email is kerrybiosphere at skdp.net. There's my mobile number. We're also on Facebook, Instagram, or and Twitter. So we're definitely easy to get hold of with any questions that you have afterwards. Um, but remember, during the talk, you can put your questions in the Q&A session if you want to ask Mary or Jessica or Callum anything. So I'm going to stop talking now and stop sharing, and I'm going to invite Mary to take over, who is going to share her knowledge with us about the plants of the biosphere. Thanks, Mary. Thanks, Eleanor. And uh, that exhibition sounds fantastic. Um, I'm definitely going to pop down myself and uh, take a look um, at the, because last year's calendar was Amazing. So I look forward to seeing the entries from this year as well. Um, so hello to everybody. My name is Mary Sheehan and uh, tonight we'll be just exploring the shores and grasslands of the biosphere. And um, so I suppose just to start off with, with the importance of wild flora, um, both in the past and I suppose present and future, and um, just looking at a few things. So over on the left-hand side, we have a little plant called um, eyebright. And um, I suppose this is to illustrate um, the, the former uses, the say the, the folklore uses of, and the name derives from the fact that it was used in um, treatments for eye conditions. And um, as you can see here, it's a beautiful little plant with a, with a lovely little landing spot there for um, pollinators. Um, so moving on then to the second slide here, we have a series of yarns that were, the dyes, um, the colours of the yarns were made from different part, uh, parts of plant. So if you want further information on this, um, the UCD Cultural Heritage Collections have a whole write-up about the exhibition and the materials used. And um, so everything from the barks and wood chip to the, uh, the Sorry, the top row here is the twigs to the, the barks and wood chip on second row. And look at the colours there and they're from roots of plants. Of course, like other things would have been added, such as, say, um, vinegar or other chemicals. But um, it's just spectacular to see such an array of colours. So plants would have been very much used um, for um, colours and yarns. Then looking at thatched cottages, they come from, say, reeds and um, um, rushes. And uh, still we have some thatched cottages left in the biosphere around the place, but these would have formed a very important part of uh, giving you a shelter. 
And I suppose all these things collectively would be known as ecosystem services. So um, wild flora is very important in terms of that. And finally, here on the right hand side, I've, there's a plant here um, commonly known as chamomile. And um, I have my cup of chamomile tea this evening to calm down and it's supposed to be good for anxiety. So let's put it to the test. But even if placebo, I'll take that. But um, it's a plant where it's in Ireland, its distribution is restricted to the southwest and uh, Kerry would be a stronghold for it. And um, I suppose that plant would be described as being near threatened in Ireland. And I'll get back to what that means later on in the presentation. So um, just then a few books that I found very useful on my journey into exploring Ireland's wild flora. And um, when I started off first about seven years ago, and the first book that I had was The Wildflowers of Ireland by Zoe Devon, an earlier version of that. And I found that good as a starting point as it gave, you know, the colors of plants, uh, the colors of flowers and the number of petals and things like that. So I found, and the pictures were very useful. Um, so I found that as a great start for anybody that's interested in um, looking at plants in the field. Um, then even though this is a big um, book, Peter Wise Jackson's Ireland's Generous Heritage, uh, Nature is an excellent book on the past and present uses of wild plants in Ireland. And you can dip in and dip out into that book and I found it very interesting in terms of all the uses that um, plant, pl wild plants have in Ireland. And um, Tainian on lower um, flora cocogina gmorlumsa maratashe shkrita askelga. Uh, the next book, the flora of cocogina of the Dingle Peninsula, is a great little book as well. Um, even though it focuses in on the the flowers of the Dingle Peninsula, there's a cohort that would we would share with the Dingle Peninsula. Maybe not the coastal plants because in the biosphere we're um, landlocked. We don't have any marine yet. Um, but certainly, and the um, pictures and the, again, it goes into some of the uses as well. So it's a great, uh, uh, lovely text and it's written in Irish as well. And finally, Kerry and Natural History by a, rain, a former ranger, Terry Carruthers. Um, it's 20 years old, but still it's over 20 years old, but still it's a great book on the natural history of County Kerry. And then just to point out some um, resources, the, the BSBI, which is the Botanical Society of Britain and Ireland, um, they've done a lot of projects um, over the last couple of years, concentrate with a, with a slant um, and support from the MPWS. So it's uh, focusing in on Irish um, species for the main part, but you know, um, it, it, it applies to the whole of the UK and Ireland. And um, they've done one on Irish grasslands and um, it goes into great de detail on the different types of grasslands and starting off and identifying this, there's um, videos there on identifying grasses, sedges and rushes. Similarly, some of the plants that I'll talk about later um, on the lake margins are in the lake. So there's an aquatic plant project as well that's ongoing. And they describe a lot of the different, like aquatic plants can be very difficult to ID. Um, so they've um, helped out by providing videos in different families. So, um, and I can provide those links uh, to Eleanor um, once um, the, the presentation is over. So uh, just a little bit about naming. So um, scientific names when it comes to flora, avoid the confusion of local names. Um, so say for example, on the left-hand side there, you have a bluebell, uh, that's what we call it in Ireland. While if I was talking to someone in Scotland, um, I could be pos they, they could be imagining the middle flower here, which is actually a harebell. And to add to this confusion, um, over on the far right, we have a plant called the ivy leaf bellflower. It's also known as the ivy leaf harebell. So on the bottom here, I put down the Latin names. Now for the rest of the presentation, I'm going to, for the most part, use um, common names common in the biosphere. And so if anybody has any other names from for these plants, um, especially when I put up the scientific names and if there's local common names for any of these plants, please share them on the chat. I'd be delighted to know um, what their local names are. So um, yep, please uh, put the names in the chat. So starting on with the flora, flora of the lake shores, and um, I suppose the Kerry biosphere is renowned for its scenic beauty. And I suppose we look at the skies and the weather forms that you'll have cloud, mist, 
rainy days, you have the, the landforms, the um, geological features, and then you have the bodies of water. But the actual flora of it make up, uh, uh, you know, gives us a special feel and gives us what is the biosphere, because I suppose, um, say, for example, the flora of um, around the lake shore, say, of uh, an upland lake, say, for example, this is in the Gillicuddy Reeks. Um, even though some of the flower, there'll be the same flora, there'll be some distinct flora that you'll only get up there. Similarly, just above it here on the centre left, this is a picture taken from Shrown Lake. And again, um, the flora there is quite different. There's a lot more um, Phragmites um, reeds. And um, the middle then is taken from an upland lake where you have a lot of floating vegetation, such as water lilies and things like that. And that, that uh, compares, you know, it's much different, say, to the upper lake in Killarney where you have these wooded islands and give it, gives it its own um, unique look. So, all of, so the flora is a com uh, essential component of the, uh, the biosphere and the scenery. But it plays a more important, some other important roles and this thing of ecosystem services. So first of all, I'll briefly go through a lake ecosystem. So um, essentially it's divided up into three sections and I've given the link to where I've got this diagram from. So from the bank top backwards, you have the riparian zone. So um, this is where you have, say, your a lot of vegetation and that vegetation is really important as it provides an essential service in filtering off pollutants and um, from runoff and thus protecting the water quality down here. And native plants accompli accomplish this by utilizing their deep root systems that secure soil for filtration and also for stabilizing the bank against erosion. So um, these plants play a, a very important part. So in the center then we have the shore zone and um, this goes from the, the top of the bank to the current water line. And depending, the water levels in lakes fluctuate throughout the year. They could be higher in winter with heavy rainfalls, and but they'll fluctuate um, throughout the seasons anyway. So this shore zone is from the bank face to the current water line. And then beyond that, we have what we call the littoral zone. So this is submerged zone. So it's from the current water line back to the, um, the lake side of things. So... Um, the riparian and shore zones in the biosphere, um, a variety of plants occupy these areas from trees such as um, the rock sorbus, which you'd see on the, the um, rocky outcrops around, say, the lakes of Killarney, to plants like meadowsweet and uh, purple loosestrife. Um, and these are tall, these are over, these could stretch anyway to 1.5 metres, 1.2 metres or thereabouts, and they're quite tall. And it, it's not only flowering plants, but you get, say, ferns like the um, royal fern. And um, then you have plants that like that little bit of disturbance, say, for example, betony, in which the biosphere is an important, um, important area for this plant. And um, all together, it culminates in, so you start with, you, you have your trees, your shrubs, your plants, and then as we get down to the shore zone, the plants are um, a little smaller. So say, for example, you have things like water mint, and um, this is a beautiful native plant, and when the leaves are crushed, it gives a really strong uh, scent of mint. Two things like, um, lesser water plantain. This plant can live submerged or exposed and when it does get exposed it throws up um, these lovely flowers and they resemble almost like buttercups but they they belong to the water plantain family rather than the buttercup family. But um, during when say the shorelines are um, during the summer when the shorelines are a bit more exposed you could have a carpet of these lilac purple flowers which say hoverflies on them and it's just a wonderful sight. Then you have plants like sneezeworth which was used in the past for things like um, treating um, ailments with uh, nasal conditions and then we have some other interesting plants like the ivy leaf bellflower and the uh, blue-eyed grass, which I'll get onto in a short while. Then moving on to the littoral zone. So this is a submerged zone. So here in the biosphere, we have a range of different type of plants that have different strategies um, while growing in the littoral zone. Some of them will be submerged 
And um, these plants are aquatic plants and they're a difficult family to key out. Um, a lot of them have basal rosettes like here and depending on which way the leaf is shaped, whether it's uh, pointed or whether it's flattened, um, that will be, that'll help the, the botanist to decide what family it is, whether it throws up a, a, um, a stole on, like say, for example, uh, you know, the way the spider plant, that, that plant you'd have at home would throw stole on, a new plant would grow out of it. So all these things will help a botanist to decide. Um, and uh, these are difficult because uh, basically you have to get into the water to see them. And I have a colleague in the National Parks and Wildlife Service, um, he's a ranger, Sean Ford, and he, every summer he gets into the cold water and he dives and looks at these plants um, under license by the National Parks and Wildlife Service. So um, yeah, I always admire Str Sean and his strength to cope with the, the cold waters. Um, so then we have plants that emerge out of the water. So say, for example, there's some leaves here off this beautiful plant called a burr reed. And the flowers on that are just, they're, they're just fantastic to, to look at. And um, the leaves, some of the leaves actually are strap-like. So sometimes it's hard if you only have leaves to try and identify this plant, but things are made easier when you have things like the flowers to, to help you. Then we have uh, floating plants, and these are things like um, our a white water lily, and we also have pond weeds. And um, so I'll go into now just describing three uh, plants that you commonly uh, that you commonly find in the biosphere. The first being meadowsweet. Now it's widespread in the UK and Ireland, and it's found in damp places. So this is a really easy one for everybody to take a look at, you know, over the weekend because it's it flowers from June to September. So hopefully it's still out and about there. It's a member of the rose family, and in Irish it's called the silver rush. It's in its past it was used as a mead sweetener, and hence its name. It's more of a mead sweet rather than a meadow sweet, and it was spread in floors, rushes, now um, in houses long ago. And this was to provide insulation, decoration, and the meadow sweet, the scent. Now I know scent is very subjective, but um, I just love the scent of the meadow sweet. So next time you're out and about, do give it a, a sniff. It's it's just lovely, and um, we have a lot to thank meadow sweet for. Um, in in 1597. A herbal, this is a book on the medicinal uses of plants, mentioned the meadow sweet. And uh, centuries later, um, someone looked at this book and uh, it led to the isolation of um, a compound called salicylin. And this eventually led to the synthesis of aspirin and painkillers. So we've a lot to thank meadow sweet for. And just one final thing on the meadow sweet um, the seeds are out right now. And when I started off, um, looking at wild plants, I went out, along to a botanical society um, meeting, and um, one of the one of the uh, botanists there pointed out, um, told me to take a look with my hand lens at the meadow sweet um, seeds, and I did, and um, they're just amazing because they look like little, and hopefully I have um, um, magnified the image enough that you can see it's like little clenched hand. They're almost like pixie hands. So it's a gorgeous thing to look at through um, a hand lens or a magnifying glass. So if you're out and about, do check it out. Um, the next flower is one that has a westerly distribution and carries a good place to see it. Um, it's thought to be native in Kerry. It's called the blue-eyed grass. Um, it's a member of the Iris family and its Irish translation is um, the small uh, blue lily. Um, it flowers from June to August and it opens its flowers in sunshine. So no prizes for guessing when the photographs were taken. Um, its scientific name derives from a time when it was thought to be confined to Bermuda and actually it's Bermuda's national flower. And this plant is one of um, a couple of a uh, good few plants actually in Ireland that have this distribution where you find it over in the um, say the eastern Atlantic and then the next place that you'd find it is off in Ireland and maybe Scotland and around the coast the west coast there of the UK and other plants include things like Irish ladies tresses. 
Now, this is a, Ireland is, a, is an important place for uh, the blue-eyed grass because over 25% of the European population occurs in Ireland. And when you think about it, that um, carries a good place to um, see it. Um, that, you know, um, it's... Um, that Kerry can be proud that it has, you know, a good population of um, the blue-eyed grass. Uh, the next plant then, I decided to choose one that's aquatic in nature. So um, it's water lobelia, it's a submerged aquatic perennial and it has one of these basal rosettes, these different, but it's um, kind of round tipped at the end and flattened. So once you get your eye in for it, it should be very easy to spot those basal rosettes. Now it needs a clear um, water and sunlight. So you'd find it around the shallower edges. So you can nearly peer in and take a look at it. And the photograph on the left shows um, some of the flowering stems just emerging out of the water. And indeed they do emerge uh, and they do grow to oh goodness, almost nearly a meter in height in some places and they have this they're a member of the bellflower family and they have this delicate uh, pale violet flowers in July and August um, so another one to watch out for next time you're walking around the lakeshore so that concludes the part on um, the lakeshores and now I'll move on to the grasslands and meadow flora and um, the biosphere has a, a wealth of different um, types of grasslands varying from the intensively managed uh, grasslands for um, dairy and uh, beef production right through to different types of grasslands and um, and these would be called semi-natural grasslands some of them. Now I suppose um, semi-natural natural grasslands only occur in say um, say places like the savannah and so forth. So in Ireland we have a kind of a situation where it's semi-natural. So just a little bit, bit about the history of, I suppose, because we have a lot of, in, in the Kerry area, we're mountainous, so we have a lot, a lot of upland grassland areas. And this is associated with a history of bullying and um, butter making and making hay. So there's a brilliant article. Um, there's a Dr. Eugene Costello, and he's based in UCC. He's done a lot of work on uh, the migration that took place uh, in Ireland in, I'd say, the 1800s up until the 1900s, um, where uh, people would leave um, their homesteads and head up to the hills and live in these booly huts for the summer. Um, and he, there's an article there, I have a link to it, and it's a really interesting one on Ireland's summer migration. But basically, um, m families, and mainly actually, um, girls used to go up to the hills and they used to bring their instruments and everything up with them. And by all accounts, they had a great time milking the cows, making the butter and singing songs. And there's um, uh, one famous Shano song called Alleluia Gauna, which translates to uh, hallelujah, the gorgeous white heifer. And uh, it's been covered by uh, a number of musicians over the years. Everybody from, say, Louise Morrissey to Earl or Leonard to... So I just type in Alleluia Nagona. And what the song is, is it's a girl who's now settled and she's uh, celebrating and reminiscing on her life up in the hills with her friends uh, and celebrating the white heifers. So they made the butter and the butter went along the butter road and even in Cork there's a place uh, called Kerryman's Table where the, um, the folk bringing the butter used to rest. And then um, when they were up on the, the mountain hillsides, I suppose down the lowlands then, that freed up the, the grasslands there for haymaking and tillage. So like I said, there's a link there for more information on that. So uh, semi-natural grasslands, these are described as being intensive, extensively grazed or maybe used for hay meadows. They're not seeded or fertilized. They can have different sward heights and that can assist in vertebrates. And um, these are very rich areas for invertebrates. And uh, a lot of my pictures here include invertebrates, including um, this butterfly here, the marsh tillu butterfly. I'll be talking a bit more about this butterfly in the next slide. Um, and there's different types. You have upland, lowland, wet, dry, permanent pasture where, um, say, um, cattle, sheep and horses graze. And then you have hay meadows. So um, now I'll describe just a few plants of the, bi uh, the biosphere. The first one is a very common one and you can find it all over uh, um, the UK and Ireland. 
and it's uh, perennial and it has a lovely lilac and it's almost like a uh, pincushion um, top on it and it flowers from June to October so you should be able to see it now. It's the larval food, pla food plant of the marsh tillery, that's the butterfly I pointed out in the last slide. And what, it, what um, here on the right hand side is a picture of the larvae of the uh, marsh fertility and this is called a web and um, they use the devil's bit scabious in their larval stages and actually this is a zoomed in picture of um, some devil's bit scabious here and you can see the web just in there. Um, it also attracts, the flowers attract other pollinators um, so it's a very busy spot if you come across um, some heads of devil's bit scabious. It was called scabious because it was used for tre treatment for skin conditions such as things like the bubon bubonic plague and scabies and um, its roots appeared bitten off and the story goes that the devil was jealous of the medicinal properties of the plant and it took it out on the poor devil's bit scabious. Now I was going to try and get a photograph of it and I said you know this is a long, uh, this is a perennial that takes a long time to to mature so I'd leave that up to your own imagination to what the roots look like. Um, so the next plant is a uh, world caraway. Now this is a plant that um, I only myself came across only relatively recently in the last two weeks so I'm delighted to talk about this plant this evening. Um, it's a perennial that flowers in July and August. It's a a uh, species of permanent pastures. So that's pastures that's grazed by horses or cattle. And on the left hand side, this is um, the habitat where this flower is growing in go good numbers and it's grazed by horses at the moment. Um, it's a relative of the spice, the caraway spice, but it has no medicinal or culinary uses. And actually, I'd be a bit frightful, a bit. Uh, weary about this plant because it's like an umbellifer and a lot of the umbellifers are actually very toxic if you think about things like um, hogweed and things like that, that um, always you should exercise care when touching plants and you know um, just be weary especially if you're not familiar with them. Kerry and the biosphere is a stronghold for the species in Ireland and um, it's described as near threatened on the Irish red list. This is a red list prepared by, um, it's prepared by a number of experts under the umbrella of the MPWS and in 2016 um, it was classified as near threatened. So that means uh, a 20 to 29 percent decline in the area of occupancy or habitat quality. And for if there's anybody listening from the Isle of Man, um, I looked up the um, database and there are a few plants, um, a few records there near Dalby on the Isle of Man. And uh, these were seen in the last decade, so from 2010 to 2019. And the final plant is the ivy leaved bellflower. Um, this is a delicate perennial uh, creeping member of the bellflower family. It likes acid, moist, peaty soil, and um, it actually is quite tolerant of a number of different regi uh, grazing regimes. But I suppose what's important to point out with grasslands is a lot, like I suppose in the UK, 97% um, of grasslands have diminished since 1930. We understand in Ireland the picture is quite similar. And a lot of this is down to land abandonment. So when things aren't grazing, it's even it's you know it can be a problem as well because um, plants like the ivy leaf bellflower are outcompeted by my more competitive plants, and then they disappear from our landscape. County Kerry is a stronghold for the species, and the biosphere indeed is a stronghold. Um, and in a text from 1916, it mentions Kerry is a, a real stronghold for the species. So it's great to see that still is the case a hundred years later. And it's uh, described as near threatened on the Irish Red List. And then just, um, just in case there's any questions about managing meadows, um, very quickly, I'll just point to some resources, um, some fantastic resources out there. One, Farming for Nature. This is an Irish website and it's all about uh, farming as, as the name goes. And it has a lot of best practice guides and one of those is managing species rich grasslands. Also, there's an, uh, an organisation in the UK, Magnificent Meadows, and they do a lot of um, guidance and help on creating or either maintaining or restoring meadows in the UK. But it would, the principles would apply and the species are generally more or less, we have similar species in Ireland. 
And of course, the pollinator plan and pollinators.ie have great guides on how to uh, create wildflower meadows. I suppose about managing meadows, one thing is when you're restoring them, it's very complicated. It's not always successful, and but it's always worth giving it a go. Um, so some of the things with managing meadows is to rest them from May to July to allow the flowers to seed. Um, late summer haymake or take out uh, or, or graze it. Um, haymaking, so because silage will um, hay making, you're turning the hay, you're shaking the seeds out and it gives it a chance for the seeds to regenerate for next year. Um, when you're restoring, you mow the vegetation and you can source green hay. And what I'll say there is a species rich donor site in the locality, because if you have one in the locality, the chances are better for succeeding because it's plants that have established in the local area and livestock to trample in. And you can use plants such as the yellow rattle pictured on the right hand side to parasitize grasses and help the um, meadows. So that concludes my section. So I'll stop sharing. And I'll pass over to Jessica now for uh, her presentation. And I thank you very much for listening. That was great, Barry. Thank you very much. I'm going to share my screen there. Can everybody see my presentation okay? Cool. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, um, as uh, Eleanor said earlier on, my name is Jess Hamilton. I'm a botanist and ecologist, um, and I'm also a wildlife photographer. I do a lot of photography, particularly of um, plants and invertebrates, but also a lot of scenery. So thankfully here um, in Kerry, I have a lot of scope and things to choose from. Um, the last few months I have been working in the National Park um, monitoring woodland plots, and I'll talk to you a little bit about those in a while. Um, so today, what I'm going to really cover today is I'm going to talk about two of the wooden types that you find in Killarney. So the oak woodlands, the yew woodlands. I'm mainly going to kind of focus on the plant side of things. So I'll look at some of the indicator species um, and then I suppose the overall importance of the woodlands. And then I'll talk a little bit, little bit about the, the permanent woodland monitoring project I referred to a second ago. So the woodlands of Killarney, I suppose. Um, Clarny National Park, you know, is important for so many reasons. And it's, you know, it's one of my favorite places in the whole world and it's hard to describe why but I think anyone that's been there and has stood in the woodlands or any part of the park you know you just get that I, I don't know it's, it's, it's hard to verbalize but it's just, it's just a spe such a special place and especially I think if you are if you are connected with nature or you have a special a particular affinity for you know plants or just landscape photography or whatever it helps you feel even more connected I think uh, um, and I think you realize the importance of why we need to you know really really conserve these habitats and uh, mind them. Um, so Clarence National Park, it holds the largest extent, um, extent track of semi-natural woodlands across Ireland. Um, within the park there are three main types. You have the oak woodlands, the yew woodlands, um, the wet or the elder cow woodlands. Uh, it's probably most famous for the oak woodlands. Um, this map here just shows some of the woodlands that are in Clarence or the ones I suppose that are more better well known. Um, you can follow my curse there. So the all them basically are oak woodlands except for the you would really the you would and I'll mention that a little bit later on as well. Um, so why are the woodlands so important? Um, I suppose as well as being a refuge for many rare and protected species, you know we've heard you hear of the likes of the Clarny Fern, um, Kerry Slug and so on, the woodlands are really of utmost importance and you know, a really strong conservation interest because of the because of the age of the woodlands and the fact that in Ireland we have a low cover of semi-natural woodland anyway in Ireland. So it's important to have these refuges and places where these habitats can flourish and be conserved. Um, woodlands in the park they cover approximately one thousand four hundred hectares, and the damp oceanic climate that we have in Ireland, especially in Clanny, leads the woodland to being really, I suppose, quite well known and famous for its rich. Um, Floor, but especially the rich uh, fern life and bryophytes. Um, in particular, this is the case for the oak woodlands. So, if you were to step into one of the Clarny oak woodlands, um, what might you can expect to see in terms of the plants and the structure? So, it is dominated by the sessile oak and the canopy, with an understory of holly, um, and it's quite. It's actually quite. Um, You'd be surprised actually sometimes how much holly can, there can actually be there considering it's mainly an oak woodland but the holly can be quite not dominant but in the understory it can be just it can be so frequent and so um 
abundant you're kind of wondering how is it kind of even surviving because of if you take into, other, into account other factors such as shading and such um, other frequent species you're going to see of tree anyway include rowan birch strawberry tree and even uh, yew uh, the dwarf shrub they are generally include species such as heather or often also called ling and bilberry the ground layer will vary quite a bit um, just, uh, depending on the conditions you know whether it's wetter or a bit drier but generally will include species such as greater wood rush bracken hard fern wood sorrel and you'll get occasional um, patches of cow wheat which is a lovely species with a really pretty yellow flower um, examples of this oak woodland type you have um, the ones I mentioned earlier on in the, or showed earlier on in the previous map. Um, so we have Tomies, uh, Glana, Galaxy Namarv, uh, Camillan, and Derry Conaghy. So I'll just, I'm going to start with the basics here, um, just so everyone's kind of on the same page in terms of the different oak species we have in Ireland. We have two oak species in Ireland, um, both are native. Um, of the oak woodlands in Killarney, by and large, are dominated by the sessile oak, which is Quercus petraea, but we also have the English oak, um, Quercus roga. Um, and so there, there are quite a few differences between the, the two different tree species, but they can actually be somewhat hard to tell in some cases. And, and of course, well, they hybridize, which can make things a little bit more confusing. But um, the main way of telling them apart is, well, one of the better ways is looking at the acorns, as the name suggests, the sessile oak. Um, the acorns have no stalk, where if you look at the English oak, it has a stalk. But obviously, if you're in earlier on in the year or when there are no acorns present or you can't reach them, that feature is not of no use to you. So um, another really good or the best way to look is looking at the hairs on the underside of the leaf. And the leaves or the hairs on the English or English oak, Quercus robur, they're going to be simple. Whereas if you look at the sessile oak, they're going to be stellate um, and star-like. And so you can see, um, I'm hoping you can see here clear enough, the, um, what I've pointed to here are the kind of stellate, stellate hairs, which you get with sessile oak, but not with English oak. Um, and if you Get a combination of sessile and simple, or sorry, if you get a combination of star like or stellate hairs and simple hairs, you've probably got hybrid in your hands. Um, but in general, though, when you're looking at when you're trying to decide what oak species you have, it's best to look at a combination of different features, um, which are displayed in the table. But by and large, like I said, um, clarinet oak woods are dominated by um, Crocus petraea, sessile oak. Um, another very common species which you're going to find in the woods is bilberry or Vaccinia myrtillus, it's in the Ericaceae family. Um, in other parts of the country, I think it's known as frahuns and blabbery. I hope I'm pronouncing that last word wrote correctly because I don't say it too often myself. Um, it's a small deciduous shrub with small oval leaves that have finely toothed margins. Um, has these really, really pretty um, drooping pink flowers, which are solitary, and they appear kind of in April, from April to June. Um, and then in the autumn time, you have these really luscious blue purple berries, um, late summer to autumn time that appear on the plant. Um, and they make a really nice little field work snack when you're kind of just going about your business and kind of it's nice to just grab them here and there. Um, but the plant is quite readily grazed by grazers. So that's one thing you'll probably notice when you're in the woods in Clarny, you don't necessarily get really lush um, or tall plants. It's all quite, um, quite low down to the ground and stunted in some degree. Um, but it can get fairly big, I think up to 60, 60 centimeters or so. Then we have Rowan or Sorbus occiparia. I think out of all the tree species, this is probably one of my favourites. Um, I try not to pick favourites because there's so many and think depending on the season, I'm going to have a different species that's going to be just, you know, in um, luxuriance at the time. But Rowan has definitely been a really key species for me this year. I don't know why, but it's, it's a very beautiful species. Um, so it's in the Rosaceae family. So if you think back to when Mary was talking about Meadowsweet a while ago, you may notice the similarities between the flowers. Um, they're, they're kind of they're like that, um, they're kind of a white frothy flower um, and they're kind of current clusters. Um, it's also known as mountain ash because it has a tendency to grow in more remote or exposed places compared to um, common ash, which is Fraxinus excelsior. Um, the leaves are also quite similar to ash um, in that they're pinnate and they're divided into many, many leaflets. Uh, greater woodbush, Luzula sylvatica. It's in the Juncaceae family. So it's the largest of all the Luzula species found in Ireland um, and the most common wood, wood rust species you'll find in the woodlands. You will get other woodrush species um, such as heath woodrush um, and the hairy woodrush you also get in woodlands, but generally they're much more scanty on the woodland floor compared to the Luzula sylvatica, especially in Clarny where it really carpets the woodland floor. Um, uh, so the leaves, yeah, they have long, 
So, so they have hair kind of running along the edges, which makes them quite unpalatable, unpalatable even to grazers. Um, and I say most of the time because um, of course if the grazers are particularly hungry and they've got nothing else to eat, they will nibble on the wood rush and you see that quite a lot. Um, but it can produce like these really lush carpets of of the wood rush. Um, it's actually quite an amazing sight to see. Um, it's a really sp um, strong feature of these woodlands. Um, and the flowers as as with other species in the rush family, they're quite, um, I suppose, quite plain as far as flowers go if you compare them to other flowers, but um, like other graminoids and grass flowers, they really merit having a closer look with the hand lens. And it's only then you really get to appreciate just how I feel, beautiful they are close up. Uh, wood sorrel, <coughs> excuse me, Oxalis acetosella, another really common uh, species in the oak woodlands and a pretty common species in general in many woodlands. Um, so it has distinctive trifoliate like um, clover like leaves which you can see in the top right hand corner. Um, it's one of the many species that gets lumped into the, um, you know, the Irish clover category, which actually isn't a true species, um, but it instead refers, to, um, but yes, yeah, so when they say Irish clover, they generally refer to several species that have trifoliate type leaves, such as wood sorrel, um, and normally it refers to species such as white, white clover, red clover, less trifol, and black medic can all get lumped as, you know, um, Irish clover. Um, but um, I think then when it comes to St. Patrick's Day, the, the two species that generally get grown or sold, they generally tend to be black medic and uh, lesser trifle. They're the two, I suppose, commercial species you might call them in that respect. Um, but the flat, you more more often than not, you kind of I think you notice the leaves because that's just you know it's called this, people call it shamrocks and whatnot. But um, it's the really the flowers that are the kind of the um, the star of this plant, and it's. Not too often, not, not that not too often see them, but you kind of have to get down to their level often to see them because they're often drooping. So you have to kind of almost like lie down on the ground and look up to the flower and just kind of then you will really appreciate them, the really kind of delicate veins and um, has a really pretty yellow center. So it's a lovely little species, a lovely little flower, and it's one flower that's uh, spring flowering. So ballpark April, May is when you'll see it flowering. Um, Heather, another large component of the tiny woodlands. Um, so it's in the Ericaceae family again. Um, it's also known as ling or ling heather, some of both. It's an evergreen bushy shrub that has many stems. Um, the leaves are small and pressed tightly together on the stem. Um, the flowers, uh, flowers even, the flowers are small, open, um, bell-shaped and a light mauve in colour. Um, I suppose it's quite, quite interesting that they have open flowers. Most species in that family tend to have kind of um, closed, far, closed flowers and you'll see that with the later um, species I'm going to talk about later on. Um, it's a, I'm sure everyone is familiar with the species. It's very common all over Ireland and I'm indeed over England and Ireland, England I'm sure as well, growing on many areas of dry of bogs, um, mountain habitats and acid soils, but it tends to occur on the slightly dry areas. Um, and it's again, it's a species that's grazed quite a lot. Um, and you can see in the top left hand or the top left photo, um, that's heather has been quite nicely grazed and it's kind of when something is grazed to that extent, it kind of takes on a shape and that's known as the pyre effect. Um, holly. Um, so along with oak, um, as I was saying, it's one of the most frequent trees you'll find in the cloudy oak woodlands um, and it occurs in the understory layer. It's an evergreen with distinctive shiny dark green leaves that have spiny margins um, and it's dioecious, meaning that ind individual trees are either male or female. Um, and one thing you may not, may not have noticed or something to look at when you next look at a holly tree. If you look at the upper leaves, most of those leaves will not have spines um, because I suppose the tree knows at that point um, when it's above a certain height or above the browsing line, there's no need for the tree to put on, to put the energy into producing spines when it doesn't need to, if the browsers aren't up there. So it's um, just something worth looking at. Um, so hard fern, this is one of the most ubiquitous, I suppose, ferns in the oak woods. Um, it's an acid loving species. Um, and the frond is once divided. Um, there are two types of frond actually on the same plant. You get fertile fronds and you get sterile fronds. So the fertile fronds, um, which you can see at the top left here, they're kind of I suppose, more delicate and thinner looking and they hold the, um, the sore and the spores on the underside. Whereas you have the sterile frond, which I think is the, um, the type of or the appearance you're most used to seeing when you think of black and fern or hard fern. Um, and it's not, I wouldn't really call it a robust fern, but compared to the fertile fern, it certainly is more robust looking. Honeysuckle. 
again, another species I'm sure everyone is very familiar with, uh, Lunicera periclimenum. Um, it's also known as woodbine. It has a really climbing, um, climbing and twining growth habit. Um, it needs sunlight to flower, so it's not going to flower if it's on the woodland floors. It has to climb up and get that sunlight in order to do its job. It has conspicuous white, whitish yellow tubular flowers. You'll often see they have a kind of flushing of pink to them. Um, it's a very popular species of pollinators, uh, visited both by um, day and night flying species, including bumblebees and moths and so on, depending on what day, time of day. And in the autumn, it produces really bright red berries. Um, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't be correct in talking about the oak woods in Clarny if I didn't mention the filmy ferns. Um, these are a real feature of, you know, the Clarny oak woodlands. And it, it, when I see them, I always know that I'm going to, you know, I'm in the Clarny oak wood and it kind of just makes the, it's almost like a homely feel to them. You know, they kind of, you're in a really nice bit of habitat and this is something special. Um, so they kind of, they kind of behave like briar fights. Um, and you get like just, if, you, if you're in a particularly kind of damp, I suppose crevice or area of the woodland it's just they absolutely carpet the woodland floor in certain areas or carpet like large areas of rocks and stuff um and they almost like they almost like it's almost like they're kind of flowing and trickling down together and if it's a particularly kind of wet spot you see the water flowing down through them um and they're only one cell thick so they're really amazing um and they're quite closely related to the much rarer clarny fern trichomane speciosum um but obviously they're, they're they're a lot more common than that species you're kind of pretty much anywhere in the oak wouldn't you be able to find them um, in the summertime or if they do if they're in an area that's more exposed and they dry out and shrivel up they look pretty pathetic and they can look quite sad and it's um, can, be, can be a bit hard then to differentiate between the two species um, but when they're, they're at their happiest and that they're at the most um, luxuriant you know when it's lashing rain and everything's nice and wet and damp um, as you know the oak wood should be um, so we have two species of um, filmy fern in the woodlands so you have wilson's fermi, uh, wilson's filmy fern hymenophyllum wilsonii and you have tundrabid filmy fern hymenophyllum tundrabidensi and there are a couple of ways, different ways of separating them uh, they both have their own kind of unique genes or appearance about them um, but the main way of separating them is you look at the indusia which contains the sori so the indusia in um tundrabid filmy fern and if you think of um think of um teeth for tundrabid teeth for tooth uh the indusia of that species um is quite finely or distinctively toothed i don't know can you make it out from the photo or not um but you'll see there are kind of tiny teeth kind of here whereas on for Wilson's filmy fern they're, um, they're not toothed at all and this bottom photo is just an example of a rock quite a large rock face now the photo doesn't really show it um but a large rock face that's actually covered absolutely covered in filmy ferns this one just one it's one of the filmy ferns is actually um it was Tom Bredense. um but you can just see how luxuriant they are and this is just one small spot and it happened I think it was in November I took that photo so it was kind of um you know that time of year where everything's kind of wet but it's like I said when they look their best um, another clarity species I could not mention is the strawberry tree, um, so Arbutus unato, and it's in the Ericaceae family, which is the same family that um, Clunia vulgaris or Heather and the Bilbria both in. And so if you look at those flowers there, you'll see um, that they are kind of bell-shaped, they're quite closed in. Um, if you compare that back to the Heather, which I was talking about a while ago, saying that Heather has a more open flower, which is unusual for that family. Um, so it's a member of the Lus Lusitanian flora, which is a group of species which are native to Ireland, um, but they originate from the Iberian Peninsula um, and they're absent from Britain. So it's kind of curious, I suppose, as to how they got there. Um, and for the most part, the members of the Lusitanian flora um, are found in the southwest of Ireland and they're quite southwest speci specialities. Um, for example, strawberry tree is very much a Clarny and West Cork speciality and you won't really find it too many other places around the country, certainly not where it's native anyway. Um, the flowers or clusters are bell-shaped, white or kind of creamy flowers. The fruits are strawberry-like in their appearance. Um, however, even though they are edible, the unado refers to that you're only going to eat them once, um, which kind of um, indicates that they're quite unpalatable. I've had them once twice myself, they're not bad. Um, the fruits take a year to ripen, so, uh, so the species is unusual in that it will have the flowers from the current year on the flower, while also still holding on to the fruits from the previous year, which is quite unusual for um, any species really. Um, and the bark is a distinctive red brown, um, which peels away, especially in older trees. And if it's a very distinctive bark, once you've seen it, you won't forget it. And you can get the strawberry tree in many places across the park. Um, not, I wouldn't say it's frequent in the oak woodlands, but you do get it, um, I suppose, more occasionally, but definitely as well on lake shores and stuff. Um, it's a really nice, lovely sight to see in the, the, um, the fruits really stand out, especially on a winter's day where you're going to just walk into the park and you're like, ah, 
there's our beauty. So it's a, it's a really lovely species, always nice to come across. Um, and I'm going uh, to mention two more um, members of the Lusitanian flora. So we have Irish Spurge, Euphorbia herberna, and St. Patrick's Cabbage, Saxifragia spathularis. Again, two members of that, um, that particular group. So again, they're pretty much limited in their distribution in the southwest of Ireland. And I suppose my other main interest is entomology and insects. So I couldn't not mention a couple of the species that are um, I suppose well known within the woodlands. Um, these beetles or species are associated with woodland or especially deadwood, which is why deadwood is such an important habitat for invertebrates, um, because they lay their eggs in the larvae and develop within them. Um, so just a couple of nice species here. We have the musk beetle here. Um, you can't really get an idea too much of the scale here, but it's quite a nice size of beetle and it's a really cool species. Um, and it's a rare species in general, um, but I've seen it, I think this year has been a particularly good year because I've seen at least four or five specimens. And this particular species, specimen in my hand, um, I was actually doing a, I was surveying the woodlands a couple of weeks ago and this beetle was just flying towards me in the air and I literally just put my hand on it. I was like, I know what you are. And I kind of grabbed it and then I got to go put a photo of him. Um, but, um, and then we have other species such as the ant beetle, which you, I tend to find um, on like really nice old holly, bet, veteran holly trees. And then you have Ruptula maculata, which you'll see uh, foraging and feeding on um, lots of species, including umbilifers like this particular species is um, middle sweet. And then you've got the cardinal beetle and you've got Leptura oilanda. Um, and I don't think that has an English name off the top of my head. Maybe it does. Might be the hornet beetle, I'm not sure, but anyway, that's why the Latin is easier for these ones. Um, so yeah, this is a nice few examples of some nice beetle species that are associated with um, woodlands. Um, I'm going to go on to the U woodland. So the U woodland in Ireland is a very restricted, restricted woodland type across Ireland, and it really only occurs across I suppose, a smattering of sites around the country, um, predominantly around the southwest, um, where it grows on outcrops of limestone that have really thin skeletal soils and you'd be kind of wondering like how are they even growing there because this, they seem like there's nothing there but like if you ever walk through uh, you wouldn't they are such an amazing place and they kind of they give me almost like a kind of like a Hogwarts kind of vibe because it's just kind of it's such a cool kind of damp atmosphere and you're going through it and because there's such a high shade it's quite dark in there and it's almost eerie I suppose but it's a really really cool place to, to get to spend time and do work in there um but yeah you see there's like these lovely enormous um, yew specimens is growing on bare rock and you can see their roots kind of just like clambering over and just trying to find any bit of soil and I suppose stock all they can do. Um, and as the name suggests, it's generally dom dominated by uh, the yew tree, but other species which are fairly frequent will be ash, holly and hazel. Um, so Rhinodina yew wood is um, Ireland's largest stand of yew woodland, native yew woodland, um, and it's comprised of two blocks on the Mokhas Peninsula. Um, has an extensive bryophyte layer, which you saw, I think you see better in the first photo, you can see the, um, just how extensive, I suppose, like I said, the bryophyte layer is there. You'll notice there is very little in the way of the field where the field layer. Um, so yeah, the has an extensive bryophyte layer on the ground, and it's generally dominated by a few species such as um, Thamnobarum alpurum and Necara crispa. Um, so it's not particularly bryophyte species rich, but um, their cover is extensive. Um, and the herb layer is generally depauperate and quite scanty because um, it's so dark and there. there's very little light in many places. But when they do light, you do get pockets of light. And when light levels allow, you can you do get some actually quite species rich pockets, really. Um, and you get species such as false brome, dog violets, barren strawberry, um, and various fern species, um, most often the heart stung fern. Um, so just to get to the basics here in terms of um, so you, we have, so we have three native conifers in Ireland, um, you being one of them. We also have Scots Pine, top left guy here, um, which is only recently, well, not recently, a couple of years ago, confirmed as being native in Ireland. We have the yew tree, which is a fellow there, Taxifacata, and we have Juniper, Juniper communis, and all three of these species can be found um, across the park. Um, um, particular species like Juniper, not in any large quantities, but they're still there and represented nonetheless. So. Um, so yew tree, um, Taxifacata, it's an evergreen, it's an extremely long-lived species, um, unusual for a conifer, it doesn't actually produce cones like you'd expect with like, you know, like some Scots pines and so on. Um, however, the seeds are held within a red fleshy structure known as an aral, which you can see just here. All parts of the yew tree are, are toxic, except actually for that, um, the aral, um, but it's at the, the, 
they ready, the birds will actually readily eat the fruits and will use the use for nesting and roosting. Um, and it's a tree that's actually that's very much associated with uh, both death and graveyards. And you hear, you see, you read about like folklore of the um, in past times that they plant using certain different places to prevent great to prevent people having their cattle in certain areas because it would obviously be toxic to the cattle. And if the if there are yew trees planted in certain areas, it would prevent I suppose them from putting their livestock in certain places. So it's a it's a very curious tree, and it's it's so much um, a lot of interesting reading surrounding the species. Oh, I don't know why I did that, that kind of funny introduction on there, but anyway. Uh, so that is the Harrods Tongue Fern. None of the other titles did that. Um, Asplenium scolopendrium, and it's in the Spineaceae family. Um, definitely by far, it's the easiest Irish, uh, easiest Irish fern species to identify. Uh, it's an evergreen and it is a perennial. Um, it has an undivided or a simple frond structure, and in its, lin its linear sori are held on the underside, which you can see in this bottom photo here. Um, the frond is said to look like a deer's tongue, and that's where the, um, the name comes from, from heart would have been an old name for a deer. Um, it's a very common species. You'll get it in most woodlands, to be honest, um, but it definitely prefers calcious, calcareous substrates, which is when it kind of, I suppose, grow it with more profusion. And then we have false brome, um, Brachypodium sylvaticum. In the yew woods, as, as I was saying, if there is a field there, the species is probably going to be there. It's a perennial species that prefers well-drained calcareous um, and neutral soils. It has a strongly tufted growth habit with leaves that gracefully kind of uh, flap or arch over. Not too really well represented in that photo, but if you can imagine nice grass species, that's kind of just gently flopping over. That's what it looks like. Um, the inflorescence, um, the spiklets, they're thin and cylindrical with long projecting awns, which you can kind of make out there. And we have Sanical, Sanical Europea. So it's in the APACA family. So that's actually in the same family as um, the wild caraway, which Mary mentioned earlier, and other species such as um, hogweed, wild carrot, uh, wild angelica, and so on. Um, the inflorescence um, is an umbel of small white flowers, which is a very common theme amongst the umbilifer family or the APAC. Many spe well, most species in that family have their flowers in an umbel type shape. Um, which is one of the easiest ways to recognize, well, one of the ways you can recognize the family or gives you a hint anyway. Um, the basal leaves are permanently lobed with long stalks and the stem leaves possess um, much shorter stalks. And it's a shade tolerant species. Um, and it's one of the species you'll get under the wood and in other shade, um, heavily shaded areas in woodlands. And then I'm going to just talk about um, dog violets. Dog violets are a very common species across a, a wide range of habitats, especially woodlands and varying different woodland, ty woodland types not just the you would. Um, and there are a couple of different species of violet in Ireland, or dog violet in Ireland. Um, the main, the two common species are common dog violet and um, early dog violet. So these, so these kind of just almost like a little kind of, um, uh, sorry, a little crib to identify the two different species. So in common dog violet, Viola verniana, um, there are two main features you can use to separate them. Um, one is that the veins in the throat of this, of this species, they're kind of quite branched and crisscrossed. Whereas if you compare that to Viola Reichenbachiana, the early dog violet, you see that for the most part, the veins are simple. And then the other feature, which I suppose is the more commonly used feature is if you look at the spur, the spur is the little projection on the back of the flower here, you'll see that in Viola raviniana, it is lighter than the petals. Whereas if you look for Viola Reichenbachiana or the early dog violet, the spur is definitely darker than the petals. So the two main ways you can differentiate them. Um, and of course they do hybridize as well, so that will complicate things a little bit if that happens. Um, and in terms of habitat preference, Viola riviniana, common dog violet, um, wide range of habitats, um, not just woodlands. Um, whereas Viola um, Reichenbachian, it tends to prefer a slightly more calcareous ground. Um, so that's the one you're more likely to get in the yew wood. But like I said, you can get both species in the yew wood. And in terms of the flowering, it can, it will, I it tends to flower a little bit earlier than common dog violet. But you know, seasons go and do funny things. I wouldn't count on that as a, um, a way of differentiating them. Um, and these are just two lovely species that um, I found in the yew woods this year. Well, um, monitoring the different plots. Um, moonwort, which is actually a species of fern, but it's quite a prehistoric looking type fern. It's overall a very, quite a rare species really. Um, so it was great to come across that. Um, the picture unfortunately doesn't show the lighting too well because it was under a really dark canopy, so I had to do a bit of editing to it. But um, it's a really amazing plant and it was my first time finally seeing it. I'd been looking for it for a number of years um, and just happened to just bump into it one day 
Um, so that was fantastic. And I think I nearly dropped my camera, the poor thing. Um, and then we have the bird's nest orchid. Um, this is a species that lacks chlorophyll and tends to grow in really dark or shaded woodland, especially on the beach, but also in um, on the edge of the U woodland and stuff. And unfortunately, you get the beach here as well. Um, but um, a lovely, lovely species. Um, and yes, yeah, so those two species there. Um, so that I'm not going to go into the details of the threats to the woodlands, but I'll just mention them here. So there are different threats to various types of woodlands, and both these threats are both applicable to both woodlands I've mentioned, as to other woodlands as well. So we have overgrazing, um, wildfires, we all know about the, the recent wildfires, the um, invasive species, um, you know, obviously rhododendron is a huge problem, but there are other species that can cause um, significant issues. And then non eating species proliferating, um, not necessarily that they're invasive, but that they're going to I suppose take over more um, of the wood and, and I suppose act invasive in some way, shape, or form. So, obviously, if you you ha you want to keep these native woodlands um, with native species and of of um, keep of good quality. And so, just onto the project that I'm working on this summer. So, um, this project started in 1991 and is continued up until this day. So, basically, there are 87 plots across. Um, the different woodlands in Killarney. It started originally with 53 plots and like I said we're now up to 87 and the plots are divided into different types. You have gap plots, edge plot, yeah, they, I don't, they shouldn't be come after gap, sorry, gap plot, edge plots and then the other one should be open plots um, and they're across three main wooden types so mainly it's predominantly they are oak woodland plots but there are also just um, there's a, an old woodland, an old holly woodland called Kumukahan and then there is the woodland plots and the woodlands are resurveyed every five years. They weren't surveyed in 2011, so this is, a, so it's been 10 years since they were last resurveyed. And we've finished all the field work now, we finished um, about three weeks ago now. Um, it's, and it was really fantastic, we were very lucky the weather thankfully, um, only a couple of days we were going to rain out, but for the most part we had lots of sunshine, um, lots of midges, lots of ticks, but um, you know, you get over that, it's all part and parcel of it all, um, but overall a fantastic time. And these just give you an, an idea of where the plots are located and the, the woods I was talking about. So we have six woods in total. Um, so we're in Adina U Wood um, and the plots are located in there on there. There are plots, um, oak wooden plots um, scattered across Camillan and Dynas. Um, then we have the Derry Conaghy wood plot, wooden plots, Blashy and the Marv, um, which is one of my favourite favorite areas of the park. Um, Klumka Hand, Old Holly Woodlands and Tomies. So just a little overview of the methodology. Um, so each of the plots are four by four meters and they are surveyed in full to assess um, different things such as tree regeneration. So like the number of seedlings are counted and the seedlings are um, separated into different size categories um, ranging from, well, inc I suppose including if they have like the cotyledons or an S1, if they um, don't have the cotyledons but they're less than a certain size or an S2 and then it goes up to saplings of S3 and so on. So every single one is counted and given a percentage cover. Um, some plots can be a bit more um, tedious than others. Um, for example, like some of the oak woodland plots um, where you, get, you, you might have had a mask year for holly the previous year, like you could be counting up to like 400 like tiny little holly seedlings, um, trying to make sure you get them all. Thankfully for the most part I didn't get to, I wasn't doing the counting, I was, the lads were doing that so I, got, I escaped that for the most part. But, um, it's a great one. Um, so this plot there is an example of a U woodland plot. Um, so in general, the, the U woodland plots were a little bit quicker, as you can imagine, because for the most part, there's no field there. There, um, the extensive bryophyte cover, um, very rocky, as you can imagine. Um, and that's just an example of one of the plots laid out in plots that are very species rich or very um, intricate. You'd, I, we would prefer to divide that just to make sure, just make it more easier and accurate. Um, so yes, yeah, so I'm. We're in the process of currently carrying out the analysis from this year's survey and the report is expected to be published in the coming months. So we look forward to getting that out for people to read. And um, yeah, so I am all, that's me done there. I will leave just with a few more photos of the insects because they're a crucial part of everything. Um, and so there are some of the nice species. We have the downy emerald, we have the green huntsman. Again, it's quite a restricted species. Actually, both they both are quite a restricted species. Um, one of the skimmer dragonflies there, and we have um, my favourite grasshopper, which is the large marsh grasshopper. Again, pretty much confined to good habitat in western counties and Killarney and places like Lingard would be a stronghold again for it. Um, so yeah, thank you very much, guys. How do I exit this? Jessica, that was absolutely amazing.
Um, and Mary as well. Just um, I absolutely love listening to uh, presentations from people who are so enthusiastic about their topic because it really shines through when you're when you're talking about it. And so next, I'm going to try and share a video from um, Mary Toomey, who works with the McGillicuddy Reeks EIP project. Um, I'm trying to find the video and talk at the same time. Sorry, I'm, this is more difficult than it needs to be. Um, and I think I'm sharing the wrong thing. So I'm going to stop sharing and go again. And hopefully this will work for you. If you can let me know if this is sharing. Can anyone see it? No, I can hear the music though. Oh, hold on one second. Let me try again. It says for some reason my screen sharing is paused. We'll try one more time. And then if it doesn't, doesn't work this time, we'll, um, we'll jump ahead. Um, hold on, now I've lost it. Here we go. Now, can you see the video or are you still just seeing blank screens? Just the I've just screen. got a blank screen. The lines are blank. Well, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna give up and I'm gonna see if I can fix it. Um in the meantime, Callum, are you happy to to do your little little talk? I know that Callum is going to introduce the live project in a little bit about what he'll be working with over the next yeah. year or so that he's he's going to be based in the Vra Peninsula, which is of course just next door to the, the Kerry Biosphere. So while I play with my video here, I'll get Callum to share his story. Thanks, Callum. Yeah. Uh, can everyone see my screen? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I'm just going to talk to you for five minutes. So my name is Callum Sweeney. Um, I'm working with the Live or Clean Eva Eco Museum project, which is going on on the Eva Peninsula right now. So I'll just give you a sort of brief introduction. Um, get rid of this. Okay, so there's three partners on the on the peninsula or in the project. So um, three partners, excuse me, three partners for each peninsula of the project. So we have on the Evra Peninsula, we have um, one university, uh, one community group, and then one council group, and the same for the Clint Peninsula. And the project's going to run for three years. So LIVE has been uh, co-funded by the European Regional Development Fund under the Ireland-Wales Cooperation Programme 2014 to 2020. So the overall goal of LIVE uh, 2020 to 2023 is to establish an eco-museum on the Ivra Peninsula and develop a new pillar for the eco and Getva, focusing on the natural heritage of the Clint Peninsula. So that involves um, the eco-museum model, which is uh, of community-led cooperative marketing, marketing of natural and cultural assets and local businesses. And the aim there is to bring tourists into the region outside of those traditional peak tourist seasons. And then that will have socioeconomic and environmental benefits for the coastal communities. So in terms of what it's trying to achieve, it's very similar to the Kerry biosphere. So in the area that we're working and focused on uh, is this pale green area here. So the coastal area of the Western Peninsula around from, oh, excuse me, around from Sneem area and then clockwise around to Kells and Glen Bay. So really neighborly, I guess, with the, the Kerry biosphere. So there's eight knowledge gatherers on the project. I'm looking at the flora of the region and other people are looking at things such as the cetaceans, the jellyfish, uh, the, the archeology, span the geology of the area, uh, as well as you might've seen uh, a lot of activity around the lizards and also the chuff, the bird of the chuff. So I joined the project a few weeks ago. And uh, the first thing I did was I went to the National Biodiversity Data Center and I looked at what the plant list of, or what species have been recorded in our region of interest. And it turns out there's 670 vascular plants. So those are essentially the ones with uh, interior plumbing and 350 bryophyte species have been recorded on the Ivra Peninsula. And so the aim of my year really is um, to have an academic project and then also to have a public engagement side of things where we do a series of guided walks, for example, Next week will be the first of, of many, hopefully, as part of Heritage Week. Um, I'll be doing some walks along with the other uh, knowledge gatherers. And uh, for example, visiting schools as well and 
uh, writing online articles. So here's an example, uh, a photograph I took recently on a recent fieldwork trip. Uh, so Count Vaughan or Bob Cotton, many hill walkers in, in, interested in the carry biosphere. Maybe uh, I've seen these recently. So area four, Mangostifolium, and then uh, some bog asphodel here in the foreground, sort of like a lighthouse. So Scullum Mona, and Arthesium uh, Here's another photo I took recently. Uh, I was surprised it wasn't mentioned, but I guess it's different habitats. So this is sort of upland bog plant, one of Ireland's carnivorous plants, Rodroctine mona, the round leaves sundew, Drosera rotundifolia. So it lives in very poor uh, nutrient deficient soils and substitutes that need for nitrogen by catching insects and digesting them with enzymes. This is approximately one centimeter across this photo. So I mentioned like a sort of academic -y side of the project. So I'm hoping to look at phenology. Uh, so phenology is the study of the timing of annual events in the life cycle of plants and animals. Uh, so as it turns out, the Valencia Observatory in Cajar Savine on the peninsula has been making phenological recordings uh, of the plants in, on site there since 1967, so over 50 years now. And when I plotted uh, what time of year they're actually making these observations, it's during spring and autumn. And so I thought, oh, that's great. Okay, maybe we can use this as a way to market the peninsula and then do some sort of project as well. So I've been talking to them uh, in recent, in, or during the week this week. Um, and I think we're gonna be doing a project there and maybe I can come back in the future and talk about uh, the findings of that project. So in essence, yeah, sort of um, raising awareness about the, the greening of the Eva in spring and then the coloration and the transition of the Eva back um, from autumn to winter. I think it's really interesting thing to, to focus on. And we're still discussing potential projects. Uh, if people are interested in phenology at all or interested in learning more about this, um, yeah, uh, feel free to contact me and I'll just give you the details. Yeah, so Gurv Margrev, um, thanks very much for listening to a brief five minute interlude. Uh, hopefully you know a bit more about the, the project now. So if you'd like to contact us, uh, you can contact us at live at ucc.ie about any questions you might have, or I can give a go at answering them now, uh, or uh, get in contact with us on socials or um, visit our website. So we've got lots of information that's already been gathered by the knowledge gatherers. As I mentioned, the lizard, the chuff. Uh, next week, we're doing, a, like I said, a series of walks. And we're hoping to do a lot more walks in the future as things open up after COVID. So the best way to find out about that is to join the mailing list through the website at www.ecomuseum.orlive.eu. So yeah, so thanks very much for, for listening to me for a few minutes. Hopefully I'll be able to come back maybe in the future when I have some more things to show you guys. Fantastic. Thanks, Emily and Callum, um, for sharing that. It's lovely to hear about other projects going on in the area as well. Um, so I've just noticed the time as well. It is uh, almost eight minutes to nine. So I think what we might do is we'll play, Mary, well, or I'll attempt to play Mary's video again towards the end. But if anyone has any questions, I think it would be best to jump into with the Q&A session now while we have all our speakers still available to answer questions. Um, so I'm just going to quickly change the view for everyone. Um, so if anyone has any questions, there is a Q&A box down at the bottom of your screen and you can type your questions in there. Um, I should have given people some warning to get some questions going. But an I just hour and a half say, ago. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. You should have been thinking this whole time. Um, <laughs> I just want to say a huge thank you to the speakers again. It's been a, such a really interesting evening. Um, I suppose I come from a different background. I haven't looked a lot at plants before. And so jumping into these kind of subjects and, and hearing the passion from people and all of the, like not just the interesting science facts, but also the, her the heritage and the culture around these plants as well is really fascinating. So thanks so much for sharing that. And um, being able to say some of those Latin names just oh, that's you know, a skill in itself that is definitely. A skill. <laughs> it's definitely not something i'm able for though to bring out a stutter for sure 
Rubus Orcuperia, I can do that one. Okay, Quarpus Rubus, yeah, no problems. But some of the others, some of those ferns, wow. Mm. No. The Latin is easier in some cases. I don't know. I think maybe she, maybe she's so, well so. practiced at it, Jessica. And the, Jessica, just to ask you about the the project that you're working on, you said that it wasn't. It's been ten years since the yes. the last study. What what's the interval of the studies? Like, how does that work? What's the reason for the big space in between? Like, is that part of the methodology that woodlands don't change that frequently, or why why is that how it's run? No, to be honest, it should be every five years, but I think it was just I think it was just a funding issue. I think and I, th I think at the times in I don't think they had a woodland ecologist. Um, so I think it just literally came down to lack of funding. So it could be done, unfortunately. Yeah. The regular five-year period, that's just based on like what you'd normally survey a woodland. Um, well, I think it's, it's the one that's been set, for, it's like five years is the one that's been set for this one. So that's why they've kept with the five-year seam. I don't know, it, it, like in, in, I suppose you'd need, you'd need that kind of time period in order to see those kind of changes anyway. So you need at least those couple of years. So five, five years, I think, is a good chunk of time in that respect for that. Um, but um, yeah, five years is what they went with. So that's what we've been continuing on with, and which hope will hopefully continue in the future as well. So there's a lot of um, thank yous coming through. I, I, I've, I've one question for each of you. Um, your favourite plant, because you know you have so much passion. There must be one that stands out for each of you. You know, oh, don't and do why? That. Don't do that. Yeah, oh, um, right. it's done now. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Um, I'll let somebody else go first because I need to. I need to really think about this because I can't. Um, well, that's Mary or Callum. Um, yeah, I mean, there's lots of. I have lots of. I suppose my real favourite would actually be the ivy leaf bellflower. Mm. Um, it's just so tiny. It's actually Zoe Devlin on her website has a picture of a hiking pole next to one of the flowers, and it's tiny in comparison. You know, it's quite small. Um, it's about the the. Um, it's smaller than a bog pimpernel, but it's, I, I can't remember how many centimetres, but it's so delicate and so, and little bell-shaped flowers. And I suppose there's a little personal anecdote. I saw it on the family farm once and I thought my mother was after expanding her <laughs> garden <laughs> with some alpine plants and it turned, and I was there like, what's this doing in the middle of uh, a grazed area, you know? And next thing, then I found out later that, yeah, no, that was a wildflower and carries a stronghold for it. So that's why we didn't put it up. So. <laughs> <laughs> so this is where the passion came from, the, the, the family mm. farm and being being connected to it. That's great. Um, we'll give Jessica another minute to think. Callum, do you have a favourite? You're, you're muted there, are you? Yeah, I think yeah, my passion from for plants actually stems from some time I had working in kitchen gardens. Um, so I got interested that way and then went on to study plant science. But in terms of wild uh, Irish plants, I love the sort of uh, trifecta or the, the, the quad vector of heather species. Um, so Coluna vulgaris and Erica cinera. Dabiox uh, heather, but um, like on a walk recently, I saw all three. And then in the past, it's been amazing looking at bell heather under a microscope and going inside the, with a magnifying glass into something that's seemingly very small. But then when you look at it up close, you see this amazing beauty. So, yeah. so all these plants with pipe work is, is your, your thing, as you mentioned earlier. Sorry? The plants with pipe work, yeah, the vascular plants. That's, no, no, no. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm looking at that's them. an excellent way to define them. I'll never yeah. forget that. <laughs> okay, Jessica, now you've had time to so. Jessica's been looking more and more stressed while everyone else I know, is talking like, while she's trying like, to pick her favourite. You look for like you you go like you go through a sweet species every year you see every year and like as the season progresses you look you know you look forward to seeing different species, particular ones. Um I'm gonna go with the species that I suppose first I first ever identified and I suppose kind of you know spurred things on. Um and that'll be a saxifrage dractylitis, which is the root of saxifrage. Um, so that was the first species I ever like sat down and keyed it out and you know identified it properly. And that was you know, a good number of years ago. But um maybe that like I like I love that one. It's like very definitely a favourite of mine, but there, yeah, I can't pick a favourite. So we'll, we'll we'll go with that one because that's the kind of the most logical one to use. But like I there's like I can't hate on any plant, I just I can't. <laughs> It's like picking a favorite child for you. It, it, it like. actually is. I, I was going to say that at the start, but I didn't. It's the same with like when like someone like asks you what's your favorite insect. I'm like, I don't know. It just 
no, it's too many of them. Some people yeah, but... equally. <laughs> we do have a question um, has come in in the chat oh. from Owen, who's asking about the herbicide treatment in the reeks. And fortunately, since I don't know myself, um, Patricia Dean, who project manages the reeks project, is actually listening in and she's typed a response back. And um, so they use a combination of different approaches that includes um, bringing in cattle to break down areas and things like that with the, the treatment, the herbicide treatment they use is as Eulox when it's suitable in different locations. And we have had, sorry, Patricia's typed in another one there, trampling bracken and ferns and cutting has also been used where necessary. Uh, some of the issues that I've, I've heard of in the project is really the accessibility of some of the areas and trying to get up to do any kind of work is quite difficult. So that adds a, another element to the work that they're doing in the REEKS project. And Kira Walsh has commented here, she has said, thanks for the webinar. It's been a great webinar. She is a primary school teacher and has worked hard on the areas that you've covered tonight, getting people in to teach the, the students. So she's delighted to have listened in and learned from you both. Um, Eleanor, I mean, there's one plant that's probably not a favourite, and that's um, the rhododendron. I was waiting for someone to bring it up. And, like, um, I know you're doing a huge amount of work on that. So would you maybe, because I know that's, you're looking for um, participation from the public. Yes, yes. Work. So we have, we've had a campaign over the last few weeks to ask people to record rhododendron where they see it. Now, this is specifically one species of rhododendron. Um, I've listened to a lot of talks since I started in this role about rhododendron. So I can tell you there are over 900 species globally of rhododendron, but there is just one that really gets out into the Pontcom. wilds in Kerry. <laughs> yes, rhododendron pontcom, and is causing oh. issues by overtaking native vegetation and it's toxic to wildlife and animals as well. Um, so we are asking people to use the National Biodiversity Data Center app and to record it. Now, rhododendron and ponticum can be found in people's gardens, but it is also found out in agricultural land or in the uplands or in woodlands as well. Now, we know that it is in the National Park and we know that it's in areas of the McGillicuddy Reeks because the Reeks project and the MPWS are working hard at trying to control it. But we have seen it start to spread out into other areas. And so what we're trying to see is really to start gauging the extent of it so we can start putting together a work plan on how we can start attacking it. Attacking it's not the right word, but managing it in an appropriate way with communities and helping them deal with it in, in their own locations. It's a, it's a very beautiful plan, uh, you know, beautiful flowers. Um, so to the lay person who says, well, why are you cutting these things down? You know, w you know, what is the thinking and the reasoning behind that? Maybe that would help. Jessica or Mary, want to give any background to the rhododendron and why it's an issue? Um, I thought it was just, um, I didn't actually quite hear your question before, but are you basically, are you basically are you just asking why is it such a problem, really, essentially, what problems it causes? Yeah, but why, why is rhododendron yeah. considered an invasive species, really? Why, why do we see it as damaging and want to manage it? I suppose if you just look at, even just looking at, you know, when it's in flower back in, God, was it May or whenever it was, um, you'll see just like large tracks of the hillsides and oak woodlands, just a wash of a bright purple colour. And that is all rhododendron in flower and it's not native species and shouldn't be there. And you can see how, just from that point of view, how much of a place it's taking up. Um, and so as it um, becomes, as it is expansive and dominates certain areas um, where it occurs, there should be native species being there. So it really completely displaces a native species. Yeah. Um, and not only that, very little to nothing can grow underneath it. If you've ever been underneath a large thicket of rhododendron. Um, it's just, it's like a ghost town to some extent under there. Like you can get bryophytes under there and I think some bryophytes do unfortunately benefit from growing under it. Um, but um, yeah, like it's 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 very sad underneath yeah. and it's just, it's really sad to think what should be there. It's unfortunately being taken over by this thug of a yeah. shrub. Um, and it, it just it just grows so well in the Clarny Woodlands, unfortunately. Um, I think out of all our, out of all our um, plots, I think, most would have had rhododendron in, except for you know that you wouldn't have not been a problem there and stuff. But like the majority would have had a lot of rhododendron yeah. in them, or at least regenerating stuff. So it's a huge problem, and um, yeah, I'll stop. <laughs> so Fred, Fred it's, it's actually a huge problem all over <laughs> in in many other places in Ireland as well. It's not just isolated to Kerry. Um, I mm. think parts yeah. of Wicklow have issues with it. Yes. All of the west coast. The issue is that it really likes our soil type and our climate here. It's originally from I think the Iberian Peninsula, the one that's come in here. 
Um, and so it's essentially arrived here, found soil that it likes and a climate that just gives it as much growth opportunity as possible. And so in other places where it might be restricted by the climate or by other things here, it's not having that, that restriction. So it's really taking over areas. So it's good to see Fred O'Sullivan there. He's reported loads of them. And uh, so that's creating work for you guys. So that's no bad thing. Um, and there is a question that's coming from Stephen Thompson. Um, thank you for a most interesting and informative webinar. Perfect. Um, is it possible that I could have observed flax on a roadside in the Kiloglin Beaufort area? Kiloglin Beaufort area? Yeah, around um, Beaufort. There are a couple of different species of flax, so um, it does occur in certain parts of Ireland, definitely. Um, it wouldn't be as prevalent down this part of the world, this part of the country. Um, if he's talking about just common flax, um, like potentially, I don't see why not. Um, the other more common species is fairy flax, um, which is in flower at the moment. So I'd, I'd be curious as to know what species of flax he's referring mm. to. Um, I would perhaps guess it's probably more likely to be fairy flax, but you do get um, the common flax as well in around there as well. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, send us a picture well. if you're if you're struggling to identify it. Send us mm. a picture. And we'll we'll pass it on to Mary and Jessica and see if we can identify which species it is for you. So Deidre's actually come up. What about the gunner? Okay, so you're looking at tackling rhododendron. I'm sure if somebody wanted to raise, um, you know, identify other invasive species, that they could share that with you. And, um, you yes, know, absolutely. Yeah, and that. and the the National mm. Biodiversity Data Center. I say this to everyone who asks, like. You can record any species through that app. So if it's something that you're interested in, absolutely record it. Um, the gunner is another invasive species. I know um, I live down in Caradaniel and around that area, there has been a lot of that spread. I think there's one particular gunner species that is spreading by seed. And so that's sort of getting out and around the place. It's that huge, it looks like a giant rhubarb plant, essentially. Um, and I think that same issue, it's overshading native species and taking up areas where we should be seeing some of our native species. So it's causing problems. So we don't, I think we, we've answered all the questions now, have we? Fantastic. Well, thank you everyone so much for listening in. Um, it is five past nine. Um, I think what I'll do is I'll play the video, but I understand some people will probably have to head away to spend the rest of their evening. So I'm going to say my thank yous now to Jessica and Mary and Callum for sharing their knowledge with us this evening and to Dean for helping me co-host. Um, and hopefully we'll see you all again next month in September and we'll be in the Isle of Man again and they'll be hosting there. So do keep an eye out on our websites and social media to follow the, the continued celebrations of the 50th year of the Man in the Biosphere program through our Tri Biosphere webinar series. Brilliant. Thanks, Hello. Thanks, Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. I will share. I'll share the video now, but if you guys need to drop off, you can head away. I'll also share, I'll upload Mary's video to uh, the YouTube channel and it'll share out through the email after this talk as well. So um, you can follow up on it there if you're not staying to watch it this evening. Now I'm just going to try and get it going before everyone jumps off and make sure that it's working. That working? Yeah, working for me. Yep. Okay, so we're here in Lyre Boy Commonage today. So um, we're basically on the edge of Cahar Mountain, which leads up onto Karen Tool. And Karen Tool is just above us there, above the lakes. Okay, so this is our um, peatland scorecard that we use for assessing the condition of the habitats. Um, so when we're looking at the condition of the habitats, we're looking at kind of the ecological integrity of the habitat, and that's the kind of condition of it. And then we're also looking at kind of threats and pressures on the habitat. So our scorecard is divided into two sections. The first section um, looks at the kind of condition of the habitat. And when we're doing this, we do a, we walk a kind of a W across the site and we have monitoring points that we stop every couple of hundred steps. And at each of those monitoring points, then there's a number of things that we look at. So we look at the number of positive indicators that we have for the habitat. So that would be the number of species that you would typically expect to find in the heath and bog sites that are kind of positively associated with the habitat. And then the higher the number of species they find, the higher the score that they will get. So we've here got a list of some of the different species that you find, some of the dwarf shrubs like the bell heather, cross-leaved heath, 
um, bog cotton, um, sundews, etc. There's there's lots of different species there. We also take account of some of the negative indicators, things like the bracken, rhododendron, bramble, and um, conifer trees that might be coming into the habitat. Uh, we also look at the condition of the mosses. So um, usually in these type of habitats, we expect there to be a kind of a good moss cover layer. Um, some of these mosses are important in the formation of peatland habitats, in the formation of the peat itself. So a good moss cover is, is important for the habitat. Uh, we also look at the structure of the vegetation. So that's looking at whether it has a good shrub, herb and moss layer and the heights of the vegetation. Um, we look at the percentage cover of the dwarf shrubs um, because dwarf shrubs are kind of characteristic of this habitat. So um, there should be a certain percentage of them present to characterize them as the peat or the heathland habitats or the, or the bog habitats. And then we look at the grazing level. So we're looking at um, the amount of grazing that's been done, particularly on the ling heather, but also on the grasses and the sedges and things like that as well. So that's the first side of our scorecard. So we would do a number of monitoring stops for each of those. Um, and then on the second side of our scorecard, we do this more at the site level. So we just take into consideration what's present across the entire site. So that tends to be things like the percentage um, cover of, say, negative indicators. For example, we would work out the area of bracken on the site and see what percentage of the site it's covering. Um, similarly, we work out the area of rhododendron and the different levels of infestation and see what kind of area they're covering. We'll look at the soil integrity, which is the areas of there's areas of bare ground or if the ground has been burnt and has lost its moss, moss layer or if there's been heavy grazing um, or erosion, we take that into consideration. Um, the hydrological integrity we take into consideration, um, looking at if the area has been drained. Um, these kind of peatland habitats are generally naturally wet habitats, so drainage can have a, a really bad impact on them. Um, we look at uncontrolled burning, so if there's been burning done that's covered large areas that's had a kind of significant impact on the moss layer and um, left lots of bare ground, we take that into consideration. And supplementary feeding. So if there's somewhere where the, the farmers are actively feeding animals over and over again, maybe where the ground is being damaged, um, we'll look at that. Um, Turbery, if there's any active peat cutting, and then just other damaging activities, like if there's been any dumping or um, inappropriate use of herbicides, things like that. So that's basically what the scorecard covers. Um, the second side of the sheet is done at the site level and the first side of the sheet is based on a lot of mo monitoring stuff. Um, so this is one of the sites that we're going to do our habitat assessments on and we're going to look at some of the plants that we can find here. Um, this particular commonage is one of the sites that's been scoring really, really well. Um, the habitat is in pretty good condition. Um, so it's one of the nice ones to look at. So we'll go and look for some plants. Okay, so here we are in the middle of the bog, so we're just looking at some of the plants that you get here. Um, in here we've got our ling heather, just some of it, and in the background there we've got some taller ling heather. We've got um, our cross-leaved heath here, so these are some of the dwarf shrubs that you kind of expect to find in the heath and the bog habitats. Um, this cross-leaved heath you usually find in the kind of wetter areas like the, the wet heath and into, into the bog a bit as well. So. The heather actually likes the drier spots, so within a bog you'll have hummocks and hollows um, and you'll often find the heather growing on the hummocks just on the drier bits in the bog. Um, and it, it's got kind of thin waxy leaves to help it kind of conserve moisture then in, in the summertime when it's hot. Um, we also have bog cotton. Um, bog cotton, we've got some of the leaves of it in here, but we've also got, you can see seed heads of it in, in the background, these white kind of fluffy seed heads. You get a couple of different types of bog cotton. So that's the hair tails cotton gra grass there, um, just with the one seed head. And there's another one, a common cotton grass that you get that has three, three or four heads coming out of it. Um, and so again, they tend to be found, the common cotton grass can actually have its roots submerged in about 60 centimeters of water. So it has special air canals in the roots that allow it to take water from above ground down into the roots where it's kind of um, totally submerged. Um, and the common cotton grass then can sometimes be in little drier areas, but it's usually indicative of the bog habitat. Um, so all the plants, they tend to have ad adaptations for living in the bog because they're nutrient poor and they're very acidic habitats. Um, one of them, one of the main ones that we get is the sphagnum moss then. The sphagnum moss is often referred to as the bog builder. 
because it, it creates the conditions that allow peat to form. So peat is basically just partially broken down plant material um, and it hasn't fully broken down because of the kind of um, waterlogged kind of acidic conditions. So there hasn't been full decomposition. So you get peat rather than soil. Um, and the sphagnum moss is really, really good at um, absorbing water and growing in wet conditions. So it actually kind of maintains the water in, in the bog. It can absorb 20 times its own weight in water and then it can slowly release the water back out into the environment. So in drier times, it can still keep the environment quite wet. Um, you get lots of different types of sphagnum mosses. I think there's over 20 species in Ireland um, in different colours, greens, reds, browns, yellows. Um, some form kind of hummocks um, and others kind of form kind of loose mats. Um, depending so and some will grow in pools and others in kind of dry, drier spots so there's lots of different species but they all help with peat formation um, and when we talk about bogs we talk about them actively growing so a healthy bog is actively growing and continually um, um, accumulating peat so that it's storing carbon and um, if you lose these kind of this moss layer um, it can lead to erosion and then the, the actually carbon being released back out into the environment. So it could be an inactive bog. So a healthy bog should be an active bog, which is actively growing. Um, so the sphagnum mosses are, um, they actually create um, microhabitats really for a range of different kind of um, microbes from algae to bacteria to small little worms and things like that, which all provide food for the frogs and the dragonflies and other things that live in the bog. Um, they're, because they absorb water, they were also used um, for wound dressings. They're really good at absorbing blood and pus and water and they're antimicrobial. So they used to be used as wound dressings in, during the war. Um, and then a lot of the other plants then grow on the sphagnum carpet. So if you look in here, we have very small little plants called sundews and um, there's a few of them here and um, so these sundews have if you can see any one leaf they have these little hairs hair like structures coming out which have what look like water droplets on them and they are actually glands and they are sticky glands and they actually attract in insects so insects see them as nectar and they fly into the plant and then they get trapped within the, within the glands within these sticky hairs and these are actually carnivorous plants so because bogs are nutrient poor um, they the, these plants have evolved to get extra nutrients from their environment by feeding on insects so when an insect gets trapped in here the the hairs kind of close inwards it this secretes enzymes and digests the insect and then after about 24 hours it'll open back up again and sometimes you're left with the hard parts of the plant that remain there so that there there's quite a few of the sundews in here you can see they're all growing in and around the sphagnum moss um so other other species that we would see that would be on our scorecard would be um deer grass this is deer grass here so it's another one which is a positive indicator of these kind of heath and bog habitats there's also bog asphodel growing in here um bog asphodel gets a kind of yellow flower it's not visible here at the moment it's just the leaves um, but the yellow flowers are, are quite striking when it is in flower. So that's another one that we get. Okay, so we're standing here in some nice bog habitat. Um, if you look around here, we've got diversity here in terms of the heights of different things. And we've got grasses and the dwarf shrubs coming in. And we've got a really, really good moss layer. Um, as you go up the hill then, these flatter areas are going to be the bog areas. As you go up onto the steeper slopes, you're going to go onto the wet heath habitat and even onto some dry heath. So it grades in and it's generally the flatter areas where we have these bog habitats. But throughout the whole site, there is a lot of variation in the structure. Um, some sites where we go on and we consider them to have poor structure, they'll have the vegetation grazed um, very close down to the ground. Um, so things won't be getting a chance to flower or to set seed and to provide cover and shelter and things. But here we've got a nice variation throughout the site. Um, so this would be, in terms of structure, this would be what we consider to be a nice habitat. Um, so on this site, we don't have any really negative indicators. Um, there are some sites where the heath and the bogs are being invaded by things like the bracken and the rhododendron or conifer trees. 
um, and they can take over large areas. And what they actually do is they will shade out all the, the native vegetation and eventually they'll be lost over time. But the, on this site, the, the, we have none of those negative indications here. So again, it's another reason that it's scoring higher marks than a lot of the other sites. Okay, so um, I hope everyone enjoyed that video. Uh, I had to say I had an absolutely lovely day up the mountain with Mary filming. Um, it was a fair old walk up, <laughs> but it, it was a really lovely day. We actually did it one of the super hot days as well, which probably wasn't the best idea. I think I drank gallons and gallons of water to recover. Um, and it, Mary is the, the project ecologist that works with the REEKS EIP project. So the scorecard there that she was showing you is how they do their habitat assessments. And they're doing a lot of work in the commonage areas up on the REEKS as well. So it's really interesting part of that project. Um, I see there's a few things come through in the chat. So just a few thanks from everyone. Um, and there is another question about rhododendron, but I think we'll leave that for this evening um, because it's getting quite late in the evening. So I just want to say a huge thank you again. I know Dean is waving at me like, please stop now. <laughs> <laughs> but um, thanks so much uh, for sticking with us. I see some of our attendees have stuck through the whole evening as well. And my apologies for it running over. But I think we don't notice the time going when we're listening to such interesting talks. So thanks again to everyone for their talks. And thank you to everyone for joining us. Um, I'll share the details out afterwards via email and any of the links that Mary and Jessica mentioned and the links to Callum's project as well. So you can all follow up individually on those. Thanks, Elinor. Thanks so much for pulling all this together. It was fascinating. And um, yeah, for, for Callum, uh, if the offer's there to come back later when the project's nearly complete, I'd be very interested to hear that. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So um, the project's not set yet. Okay. Um, we're deciding or uh, going to have a talk about maybe some uh, citizen science to, um, to compare the phenological recordings of the plants that are in the garden at the Valencia Observatory with the wild ecotypes on the rest of the peninsula, because the, the ecotypes that are uh, that are grown in all of the phenological gardens across Europe all are all clones from the Germany from from Germany basically where they all come from. And that's so they're standardized across all the gardens for the phenological recordings, you know. So compared to the rest of the peninsula, it might be something really interesting to do. So that's a good advert. You, and, you, you um, get, get especially since most of them are trees, and most of the trees, most of the. Sorry. I so, say yeah, good advert to try and uh, get people involved. So uh, I, I yeah, know Eleanor's got an awful like lot of contacts. <laughs> Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. We'll we'll be sharing the project out as it, as it develops as well. So do keep an eye on our social media. And I know um the live project itself is very active on social media too, so you can find them there as well if you want to follow them and all their their activities. You do see some posts in Welsh. I'll warn everyone because they are partnered with uh, a place in Wales as well. But that I think adds to the interest level when you're seeing the comparison between the two. Yeah. And, and thanks to Kelly for joining <laughs> us from the United States. It was lovely to have you. <laughs> thanks, guys. Um, thanks very much. See you again. Bye bye. Bye, everyone. Have a nice evening. Bye, guys. Thank mm -hmm. you.